asking how you guys are doing for like 15 years. <laughs> and I always add it back like, well, I'm doing good too. Like no one's ever asked in 15 years. Finally, somebody think I'm doing, I'm doing okay. I'm doing all right. I'm doing good. Thanks. Thanks for asking. I really appreciate that. It's good to be here. Uh, I'm excited and I'm going to put it out there right at the beginning, right at the outset. This sermon is about money. It's about giving. <laughs> I can tell you're excited, but two of you applauded. That was nervously because you're hoping I would like cut it short or something and feel good. The rest of you went immediately like this. Even the women in the room grabbed for their wallet in the back. Like I'm no, I'm just going to lay it out there right at the beginning. It's about money. This is one of the subjects that the Bible talks about more than anything, especially Jesus talks more the, about probably anything he talks about that he talks about money. I'll be honest with you. One of my most often topics that I preach about at home is money. Now, parting with a dollar is a religious experience for me. I'm very cheap. I'm very cheap. There's just, but there's things ingrained that have been ingrained in me, in my marriage. Sarah and I have been on the same page of this from the word go about how we spend money and, and how we save money. And so we preach it to our kids all the time. Me in particular, not so much Sarah in the preaching part. I, I get preachy about everything, but I preach it my kids all the time about money. I, I can't tell you the last time I said anything in this church from the public, from our Sunday morning gathering about money. Couldn't tell you. So the church has a rumor about always getting that. What does the church want? They just want my money. And we get the same rumor, but it's just simply not true here. I don't care what you say. I don't care what anyone would say. It's not true. And it's not true. Even what I'm about to preach and lay before you, I don't want your money. This is about our relationship with God and what we do. And I don't preach about this and teach about this, but today I'm going to preach about money. So I'm just going to tell you that out of the gate. And we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. And I do believe that this is a very vitally important, vital, vitally, vitally. This message is vitally important for how we consider how we walk with Christ. 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 is where we're going to be. Let me, let me actually, though, uh, begin with uh, uh, back up. 2 Corinthians 1. This is for free. First service didn't get this. Just as we were singing this last song, I pray and thinking about our church. I, I think we need to start at 2 Corinthians 1. Is that okay? I don't know what I would, I was going to do it anyways, but <laughs> even if you all said no, 2 Corinthians 1, 8. Wow, we got, oh, we're okay. We got, we got a lot of time. And I'm going to use, I'm going to use that time. Don't worry. I want you to get your money's worth. <laughs> I used to look at the clock like 45 minutes. Boy, we're going to get out early. I don't even bother. I don't, I don't want to warn. If we do, we do. That's the grace of God. But I, I don't think the winds are blowing today. So it's ready to go. Yeah. Let's do actually, let's, let's back up to verse three, second Corinthians one, three. I think this might help us with maybe something the some of us are going through, even just personally, just with this, but also I think it helps shape some stuff to understand giving. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Paul's beginning this letter with right out of the gate, everything that we have received, we've received it. We've been comforted. We've been blessed. Why? Because I might be able to comfort somebody else with the same comfort from which I've received. We're going to hear this again, but I'm blessed to be a blessing. Uh, I forget where I left off. Five. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. 
If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we say that we suffer. Everything that we're sharing together in this body of Christ is together. So, so as I'm suffering, as I'm comforted, then I'm able to help you. If I've, if I've experienced suffering, then I know what it's like to go through suffering. I may not know exactly what you're suffering with. I may not have been through exactly what you've been through, but if I've experienced pain and suffering, I might be able to help you. If I've been comforted, then I could comfort you because I've been comforted. I forgot where I was at again. So seven, this is all just free stuff. So seven, our hope for you is unshaken for we, you, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, we will also share in our comfort for we don't want you to be unaware brothers. What happens in second Corinthians a lot is Paul opens up his own life that people can see some of his heartache and his suffering and things that he's gone through. So I don't want you to be unaware. He says of the affliction we experienced in Asia for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. This is the apostle Paul saying, I don't, I don't want you to be unaware of what happened to us. We were so utterly burdened. We had so many trials and, and, and struggles that we went through that we despaired even of life itself, that we found ourselves even praying at times, God, just end all of this. I don't want to live anymore. I can't take another day of this. But all of this happened. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death, verse 9. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. I absolutely love that section of 2 Corinthians 1. Who do you, what do you believe in? I always think about it this way. What do you believe in? I believe in this or I find comfort in this. I find strength in this. Oh, I find strength in God. What does he do? He raises the dead. What does your thing do? You know? It goes from zero to 60 and four. Like, who cares? That'll break in a second. Or my daughter will be out driving and get in the way and you'll get in a wreck or something. Yeah, that happened a couple weeks ago. So she's not in this service and I want to make her feel bad about it. But your thing or whatever that is, Paul will be saying, well, you know what, my, what I believe in? You know what I find strength in? You know what I find comfort in? God. And he raises the dead. Even when I despaired of life itself, he has brought so much comfort and joy and strength into my life that I could endure any circumstance, anything that you throw at me. I have God who raises the dead. He redeems stuff. He brings it back. He, he rescues things. He's in the redemption business, the restoration business. That's the God that I believe in. And nothing that you can do can prevent him from doing his work. And that's the God who has graced me with all the blessings in the world. Everything that I have is from him, the one who died for me. So to understand where we're about to go in eight and nine, you got to understand that part. And I have to ask out, the, let's just ask, ask it as we begin. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Do you know sitting here today that you have been so graced and so blessed by the most precious, important, powerful, amazing gift that you could ever be given his son, God's son, Jesus Christ, that we have salvation in a future and eternity with him in heaven. Beyond the shadow of a doubt, when I know that, now I understand things about what it looks like to walk in grace. And so we talk about money and giving and generosity and blessing. Well, I get it and I understand it. I get it and I understand it, but I still in my flesh cling like this. Okay, bring it on. Let, I, let me hear about giving, but I'm holding tightly to the word and I got my wallet clinched because I'm afraid like the usher's coming by to, 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 to nab me right now. To fully understand what it means to live a life of generosity to a life of grace, we have to understand the grace that we've received. So if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you don't understand the things of Christ, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to be offended by this. If you're here today in your relationship with Jesus Christ, you'll probably be offended a little bit at some parts because we're just humans and we get offended all the time. My prayer, I told it first service, if we could just pray one thing for our church, I pray we never get offended. Just never. Uh, another quick side, and then we'll go to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Uh, Pastor Jason Moore, I meet with him a lot, and he told me about this book, to be clear, to be fair. I've never read it. 
I just have the cliff uh, notes from Jason, what he told me, and it's one of my favorite books. So I'll just put it all out there. <laughs> I do. I actually own a copy of it now, but I, don't, I, I may someday read it, but I don't think I need to because I got all I need from Jason. It's called The Bait of Satan. And I've talked about it endlessly for years and I've never read it. But I love it because the bait of Satan, the, the theme, the premise of the book is about of, offended. If I can get you offended, the bait of Satan is offended. If I can get you offended, now you're upset and you, we do this like, hmm, hmm. I'm not going back there. I'm not going to talk to them. They did. If I can get you offended, boy, I can wreck your life. I can wreck your life. Boy, I pray we don't get offended. I pray anything that we hear, let's hold closely and tightly to this. If you want to be, have conviction, have conviction. If you want to be like, I don't think that's in the Bible, then come at me with that. But don't get offended. That don't help us. 2 Corinthians 8 to 9, understanding who we are in Christ, whose we are and all that we've been given. The apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth about encouraging them to give. Paul's encouragement to give. We always have to understand in context what's being said. So what's 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 about then? And then understand some principles for us today. So 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 back then is Paul writing to the church about a gift for the poor in Jerusalem. He'd already talked to them about this before in 1 Corinthians actually 16. We're going to eventually get to 8 and 9, but 1 Corinthians 16, as we, he ends that letter, it says this. Concerning the collection of the saints, that's the collection for the poor, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of the week, each of you is to put something aside, store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. And when I arrive, I'll send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will accompany me. So he ended the first letter of first Corinthians with, listen, we're going to have a collection of the churches for the poor in Jerusalem. So on the first day of the week, set aside some money so that when I come, you're not scrambling around thinking, oh, great, Paul's here. We got to get some money together. You've already set it aside and dedicated that for the use of helping the poor in Jerusalem. Then we get to second Corinthians eight. And there's actually one other little context piece we can pick up in chapter 8 itself, verses 10 to 12 of 2 Corinthians 8. And in this matter, I give my judgment. Verse 10 here. This benefits you, who a year ago you started not only to do this work, but also to desire to do it. The work is collecting the money that will help the poor in Jerusalem. So now... Finish doing it as well so that your readiness in desiring it may be matched by your completing it out of what you have. So the context in 8 and 9 is, I'm going to be coming to collect this money that we've decided together we would pull our resources, set aside a little bit each week to be able to be used for the poor in Jerusalem. That's the context of 8 and 9. We're not going to read all of 8 and 9. I just want to pull some principles out of 8 and 9 that apply really to what the church was going through then in this collection and have some things to say to us today thinking about giving. So 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 9. Here's some lessons from Paul about giving that we see in these two chapters. We want you to know, brothers, 2 Corinthians 8, 1. We want you to know, brothers, brothers and sisters, about the grace of God that has been given amongst the churches of Macedonia. We want you to know about the blessing that has happened amongst the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, this is an interesting verse. In a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. We want you to know about the blessing that has happened in the churches of Macedonia because they too have been participating in collecting money on behalf of the poor in Jerusalem. And notice how he says this. They had a severe test of affliction. They have an abundance of joy and an extreme poverty overflowed all together and in a wealth of generosity on their part. This doesn't logically make sense. If I had a severe test of affliction and all this going on, and you said, hey, where's the collection for the poor? But listen, we've been through some tough times. We need to hold that money back for ourselves. And Paul says, let me tell you what's happening in Macedonia. Those folks are so generous, such an abundance of joy amongst them right now. God is blessing in their church and what's happening in their lives because of their willingness to partner in the work by putting aside money to be a part of this work and to bless other people. And God is blessing that church. 
There is something that has happened. They are so generous. Out of their even extreme poverty, they're generous. A bunch of years ago, when I first, before, right before I came to this church, actually it was about 20, 22 years ago, I was on a mission trip in Nicaragua. I remember when we started the trip, uh, we was 10 guys, 10, 12 guys. I was going to the chapel in Akron at the time. So it was a group from the chapel. We're going to Nicaragua. When we started out the first day, we had kind of a base camp. Um, it'd be like staying in a gymnasium basically here. And from that place, we would travel a couple of days at a time to different villages. The first day we headed out, the guy who was the leader of the group, he was an interpreter for us and he kind of helped guide us wherever we were going, had his truck. We stopped at a grocery store. Don't picture Giant Eagle. Picture like a garage with just some items you could buy and mainly had looked like 50 pound bags of stuff. He brought two 50 pound bags back from the store that he got. Somebody said, what's that? He said, this is a bag of beans, a bag of rice. This will be what we're eating this week. That was going to be our meal. And the only thing different on it was what you could do with it. Some places had eggs you could throw in with those beans and rice, but we ate that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But when we'd go to each village, now village and homes, I'm talking dirt floor huts where we traveled to. People that had nothing. And I was so blown away by every time we entered into these villages and the huts and the places where we would stay, how they were willing to open up the doors and to offer us anything they had. Out of their extreme poverty, they had an abundance of joy and generosity to say, this is here. We have guests, have this. That's all they had. I think that's kind of the picture that Paul's saying here of the churches in Macedonia. Out of their extreme poverty, out of a severe affliction, an abundance of joy, that combination led them to be overflowing with thanksgiving and generosity, and they gave. And so Paul's pointing to the church in Corinth about this church. Even verse four, kind of really pulling the heartstrings a little here. They were begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by, uh, by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. Verse seven is really important in this too. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. As you're seeking to be excellent in your walk for Christ, in your words and in your actions and in knowledge and understanding, excel, be excellent in this act of grace, the act of grace of giving. Verse 8, I say this not as a command but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. The first thing that Paul gives us here in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, as I think some lessons about giving, is number one, giving is an act of grace. It's an act of grace. Grace has an action to it. What, what is Grace. It's a gift. It's giving. It's the actions of grace. For God so loved the world that he gave his son, Jesus Christ. That's grace. You and I have received grace. Grace is an action. We have received, therefore we give. It's an action. There's, there's something that we do. And Paul pointed out two worthy examples. We talked already, we, we mentioned as we're reading Macedonia, the churches in Macedonia. I want, Paul had no problem pointing, kind of shaming one church and saying, hey, you guys aren't up to snuff right now, but take a look at what Macedonia is doing. In the American church, I feel like that's offensive all the time. There's that offended thing again. Oh, how dare you tell us that we're not as good as the churches in Macedonia? I'm not saying that, but what Paul is saying is, I want, I want to give you an example of a group of folks that are doing it. And hopefully that causes us to say, man, we could do better. And so Paul's doing that throughout his letters. Here he does, take a look at Macedonia. Look at what they're doing. He also pointed, you can't get any better than this. He pointed to Jesus Christ, verse 9 again. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know the gift of Jesus. You know the grace of Jesus. That though he was rich for your sake became poor so that you by his poverty might become rich. Jesus gave us everything so that we might become rich. He gave up his life for us so that we might become rich. 
giving is an act of grace. Jesus Christ is an action of grace. He gave his life for us. God gave his son for us. So if we've received grace, Paul says at some point, it ought to act. It ought to do something. We're going to focus on the giving part of it today, but it's time. It's my talent. It's my, my treasure, but it's all those things I've received. Do you realize they're blessings from God? Everything that I have, if I understand it correctly, it's a gift of God. Everything that I have, I've been blessed by God. Will I hoard it for myself or will I give? Will I be generous? Paul says, it's this giving thing we're talking about, it's an action of grace. To prove the genuineness of our faith, faith is going to act, it's going to move. The second thing he says, well, there's a bunch of things he says, we're just going to summarize three of them. Chapter 9, verse 7 of 2 Corinthians. Each one of you must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. The second thing Paul instructed the church there was, number one, understand it's an action of grace. Number two, understand, give what you've decided. Give what you've decided in your heart. There's no one standing before you and saying, everyone in this church needs to give $500 today. Or any amount. It's, Paul says, give what you've decided. So that means there was some intentionality required. It was to be intentional. One theme that you see dominant throughout scripture is giving of our first fruits. So how much do you tithe? What do you give? Is it 10%? 10% you see in Old Testament law. Paul here says, give what you've decided in your heart. Be generous. Don't do it under compulsion that someone's forcing you for God loves a cheerful giver. My mind, it's that. If you're going to be that upset about it and that, like, I, I'm so mad at this and I hate giving and I hate, don't, then don't give. Don't do it. Just don't do it. If it's that big of an issue and you have an issue, that's a hard issue and something's going on. Because I don't want your money. This is not what this is about. It's about us walking in faith with Christ. And Paul says, God loves a cheerful giver. So give what you've decided in your heart. Not because somebody commanded you to do it. What we do see throughout is the first fruits, what I'd call the first fruits principle. Proverbs chapter three is a good example of this. I'm sure a lot of us here know Proverbs three, five, and six. Proverbs chapter three, starting at five. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. A lot of this, when we talk about giving or of anything, really time, talent, and treasure, really is a, is a picture of trust. Do we trust God in this? Do we trust what he's given us? Verse seven continues here. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your first, the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. I think that's my new life verse. Those two verses. I'm going to honor God with the wealth of my first fruits of my produce. So he will fill my barns with plenty and I will have vats bursting with wine. At least with some of your looks, I went over, went over better than the first service. I didn't get it. This picture, I'm sitting around in my house with just vats of wine everywhere. What's going on? I've been giving to the church. God is blessing. The picture there is, I receive this gift, this blessing, and I want to say thank you to God first. And so I give what I've decided in my heart, what I think is right to give back to God. And I'm honoring God with that and say, thank you so much for your gift. And I want to bless you and say thank you to you. And I do that in practical ways all over. I may give to the church. I give to this organization. I help these people. I help this individual. God has blessed me. So I want to say thank you to him. Even if you just follow a 10% rule, what's 10% of a dollar? <clears throat> 10 cents. That's good. I need help with this. This is the interactive portion. I don't know math. What's 10% of $10? What's 10% of $100? Man, this is good. You're a smart crowd. So if I get $100, at most, biblically, all that you see is a 10%. God says, out of that first, give me $10. Isn't it funny how small $10 seems when I go to lunch after church? Isn't it weird how that same dollar feels like an enormous amount of money when I go to put it in the plate to give it away to somebody else? Like, oh, my life. But then we'll go to like Starbucks today and like I ordered two drinks 
That's $13. I was behind somebody. I mean, I go to Starbucks all the time. I just get a regular coffee. I didn't realize I was behind someone, and I almost had an out loud. This lady was like a vanilla soy, whatever. And, and the lady goes, that's 4.30. And I went, <laughs> I was like, what? No wonder when I go here with Sarah that my bill is like $18, and all I got was a small coffee. It, isn't it weird how that little bit of money seems like nothing? Ah, no problem. I mean, on average, when I make $100, I have no problem spending 120 But when the church or when somebody needs something and I go to give, isn't it weird how hard it is to get rid of that same money when I'm not spending it on myself? It's just interesting to think about. Paul says, listen, give what you've decided in your heart. And if you think this is an overwhelming burden, all God ever asked for was 10%. And do you think it's about the money? The cattle on a thousand hills are his not about the money it's never about the money it's about what's going on when i cling to what i have so closely and i become so greedy rather than being generous i'm missing something this that's the principle so paul says what have you decided in your heart you and god you your family your spouse and god you and your house and god to say this is what we're going to do let's be intentional because giving is really a matter of my heart and trusting God. Think about with the crops. If I give to God what's first of the crops that I've received, what if I don't have enough left for me at the end? It's really a picture. Do I trust you that you will provide for me? Or am I trusting myself? The third thing that Paul says here that I think is really important for the church then, and we're already kind of indicating some things for us too, but in chapter 9 there again, verse 8. We're blessed to be a blessing. God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Paul says, you realize that when we're giving to others and contributing to the needs of other people, it's actually causing thanksgiving to be given to God. So that when I give to somebody else, they're giving thanks. Let's be honest, in our flesh, sometimes we want thanks back to us. We want to be acknowledged. I want a plaque. I want a certificate. Look how much I've given. But he said, ultimately what's happening is, those folks are saying, God, thank you that you provided for my need. And he used us to do it. And it's causing thanksgiving to go forward. It's ripple effects that God's grace is abounding and growing on behalf of, because of what's happening to the, with the needs of other people. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This one's not in your notes. This is a little extra one um, reading through yesterday. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15. Second Corinthians 4 15 for it is all for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people it may extend increase thanksgiving to the glory of God not about us not about us being glorified it's about God being glorified so the more that we're offering a blessing to somebody else maybe they're offering then a blessing to somebody else and they're offering a blessing to somebody else and thanksgiving and glory is being increased to God because the ripple effects again keep going out they keep, we're blessing, and I've been blessed, and I'm blessing you, and, and they're blessing somebody else, and they're blessing somebody else, and they're blessing somebody else. I, um, I don't know how long I've had my car now. I can't remember. I, I saw this played out. I never see anybody act this way. I think it's different cultures and church and understanding of things. I went in a hospice patient of mine. I just got a new car, and, and uh, it was a gift to me. My, my grandma had passed and left some money, and my dad blessed me with a car. And I remember going to the hospice patient. I'd been with this family a lot. And they said, oh, you got a new car. I'm always scared to tell anyone I got a new car. Because, oh, it must be nice. Must be nice. Oh, boy, church must be doing good. Boy, you're really pulling in the money from people, aren't you? Got a new car. It's like, I'm not allowed to have a new car. But I said, listen, uh, yeah, I got a new car. My, my grandma passed away. And I don't know what she did, but she did right. Her and my grandpa, they, they, they gave their kids a lot of money. And my dad wanted to bless me. And he bought me that car. His reaction, I will never in my life forget. Because I'm used to being like, hmm, must be nice. His reaction was this, praise Jesus, praise Jesus. And I'm like, what? 
He goes, I, I, I love being around blessing. God is blessing you, and you're in my home. Boy, it's, just, it's, it's, it's all over. I'm going to be blessed because I'm around someone that's being blessed. We don't think that way. We're like, oh, you were blessed? God got you and knew this? Now I'm mad. <laughs> he didn't give me nothing. And too often we think that way. This guy was, I want to be around people being blessed because I'm giving God praise for what he's doing in you. Maybe I'll get a little bit of that too. But even if I don't, I'm giving God praise that somebody's being blessed. It's abounding in thanksgiving, abounding in praise. Are we abounding in grace and abounding in thanksgiving and abounding in generosity? Or are we clinging to our stuff and clinging to our things and looking around more like this? mine it's mine i'm hesitating but like my precious <laughs> my precious my precious don't touch it it's mine and we get so greedy and we don't realize that all of this is breaking strongholds in our life it's so important so paul says to the church in corinth listen we have an opportunity to be a blessing to these the, the poor in jerusalem and I'm coming to collect that. And remember, it's an action. Grace is an action. Giving is an act of grace. It's us acting upon our faith. It's us acting upon what we receive. It's us putting into motion what we've been blessed with. You've received it. Now do something with it. It's not about you. Give what you've decided in your heart. So this is personal between you and God. This is not across the board. This is not mandated. This is not under compulsion. This is give what you have decided in your heart. This is you and your household deciding. If you choose not to give, I'm telling you right now, you're missing on the blessing. And greed will grow in your life. That's part of the sermon that gets preached in my house every day. And I'm at fault for not preaching it to you because we're family. My kids hear from me continually. When you get a dollar, you give some to God first and you give some to your savings account and then you can spend what you have left. But be very careful even with what you have left because you'll be tempted to want to buy stuff you can't afford. So if there's something you really want that you can't afford, save what you have left and wait till next month. Our culture and our world does not believe in that. We are so impatient. I want it and want it now, and I've got a visa. I've got three of them. If I want, I can get it now. Boy, wait. Learn to wait. I, just as a side, this is for free. If we're old in the room, it's too late. You've already got 40000 of debt, and you've got to figure that out. One of the most stressful things in a marriage and in relationships is trying to figure out debt. No one preaches that. No one teaches that. For some reason, for Sarah and I, it was just easy. We just, we, I, you know, parting with a dollar's religious experience for me. It's very hard. We just believe in paying cash. We still use an envelope system to this day. I'm that old guy that's, I told Rachel the other day, I was like, if I die, check all my books. Cause I got money hidden all over the place. I'm just like, I'm that person. I believe in paying cash for everything that I possibly can. I'm telling you, young people be very cautious as you start growing up and start accumulating debt. Learn to appreciate and value what you have and to wait on something and to save some kind of money for things. You will enjoy it and it'll bless you and it'll be such a wonderful experience and then you'll be driving for free or you'll be doing whatever your hobby is for free. Be very careful about crippling yourself under the weight of debt because it's enormous weight on a marriage. It's enormous weight on relationships. And that's not anything that most people are preaching and teaching outside at least my house. I know they're getting it every day. It's so important to hear and to think about. And then what happens when you stand at church and the pastor says, boy, there's this need or this thing. I'm like, well, I can't pay or I don't have any money. Well, man, we throw money around all over the place for all sorts of other things. No wonder we don't have money to help anybody else because I've already spent 140 of the 100 I made on myself. I believe we're called to be generous. I believe we're called to contribute to the needs of other people. And that's what this is really all about. Think about those same three words or concepts for us today, just as a summary to think for us. Excellence, intentionality, and blessing. When we talk about giving, when we talk about money, it certainly is, applies to our, our talents and our time. Let's be honest, the most important, valuable thing you have is time. We have is time. A lot of people get easier. I'll write a check and leave. I'll never have to do anything. It's, it's a lot harder to go and spend time. 
So that's important too. But we're talking about money. Think about money in terms of excellence, intentionality, and blessing. I I look at my role here a lot as kind of like a coach. I like coaching. I love coaching kids. I love being a part of it. To not say something about this and to challenge us the way Paul is here in 2 Corinthians to be excellent is wrong. It's like me working with the kids in baseball right now and only challenging them where you, you know, you're fielding okay, at least fielding, and you're hitting okay, but I'm never going to challenge you and work on how to catch a ball. I worked at practice last week. I'm still coaching little guys, you know, all right, let's work on catching because last year we stunk at it. So let me see where we're at. Kind of get a little test. So I'm just going to lob them in. That's it. I had four kids crying before the end of practice. I busted one in the nose. I busted two in the leg and the other one took one off the chest. And it's like, fellas, let's go. Glove here. And they're like, ah, you know, right off the nose. I, I'm wrong if I'm not enough. We got to be excellent. And if we can't catch, we're going to be in a lot of hurt. Literally. Church, we may be doing well at serving. We may be doing well at, at giving. Maybe, boy, we can sing really well and we can do all this. I want to challenge us. Are we being excellent at giving? Are we being excellent at generosity? Are we being excellent in being good stewards of what God has given to us? And I want to set the bar high to say, let's be excellent. Let's be excellent. In all things pursuing Christ, let's be excellent. This is not a judgment to look left or right. Well, they're doing better. They give more than me. This has nothing to do with anybody else but you and your house and me and my house. You do know that only one person knows who gives what in this church. I don't know what you give. I don't want to know. And I don't care what you give. I, let me rephrase that. I don't know what you give. I don't want to know what you give. I care very much about what you're giving because it's a, it's a real picture of your heart. I believe with all my heart that I could tell a lot about your spiritual faith and journey in life if you would allow me to hand me your checkbook, if you even you whatever you use, and to hand me your calendar. If I could look at how you spend your money and how you spend your time, I can tell a lot about where our faith life is at. So I care very much about that, but I do not know and I will not know what you give to this church. So if you're one of the big high rollers in the place and you're giving a lot of money and you want to ease up next to me at some point and thinking that I'll give you some extra credit for that, you're wrong. Actually, if I did find that out, I would be, I would shy away from you because I think you're a jerk. But let's be excellent. And with excellence requires intentionality. It requires intentionality. I don't know what the other boys on my baseball team have been doing in the last six days. I know what my son has been doing in the last six days. Not because I'm yelling and screaming at him. I'm his dad. And he likes practice. So, son, every day we've got to work on getting that mid up. Every day. My son wants to play first base. He wanted to play first base last year. I'm his dad. Guess how many innings he played first base last year? Zero. Because I would not let him play first base because he's not ready for first base. Number one, son, you are going to get hurt because you can't get your glove here. So every day this last week, we got to get that glove up. We got to get that glove up. We've got to work on you catching the ball because I want to help you get to first base. It's intentionality. Give what you've decided in your heart, Paul says. So what have you decided in your heart? That's a personal thing between you and your house and your family. Give what you've decided in your heart. There's a lot I do wrong and a lot I do wrong in faith. One area that for Sarah and I, for whatever reason, from day one, we established as a pattern in our marriage. I don't care what we make. I don't care how much our bills are that month. First and foremost, the first check, the first thing that goes out every month and we decide this new every year, how much are we giving to God first? And I don't care if we got a bunch of bills that month. I don't care when my daughter totals the car. I don't care when she gets in another wreck eight days later. I don't care. (laughs) This is what happened in my week the last two weeks. 16 year old driver, it's wonderful. I don't care when she hits, you know, takes the mom's van out and bumps that one and now everything's mess. I don't care. I got a scratch on my car right now, all of our cars. I just would caution you where you're driving and parking this in Rootstown right now. (laughs) I don't care. The first thing out of my house of everything we make goes to God. What we've decided, that's between us and God. No matter what, for 20 years of marriage, that's first. And I preach that and teach that and I do mandate that right now for my kids because they're children and they will buy a thousand M&Ms. They will make themselves sick 
on buying selfish pleasures rather than giving to things that really have meaning and value. We as adults don't do things like that. Children do. But for my kids, they do. And I'll hold up my daughter right now who's hitting everything in Rootstown because I'm very proud of her, not for her driving skills, but for she got a job and she's been working. And she came down two months ago with her cash. And she said, Dad, she handed me a wad of cash. And she said, this bit is for the church here and this is for my savings account. And I'm very proud of her because I've been preaching that message and preaching that message at her for 16 years. From the time she was born, I was like, hush little baby, give all your money, you know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they get it. My kids get it every day. I don't, I don't know what you think or what, I don't care what you think because that's my house. And she did it on her own without me even asking or telling her. Got to put money in that savings account too, Marie. You got to do that. You got to, church is first. Church is first. The church is first. Be intentional with purpose and first fruit. So I'm just, I'm going to let that sit there and you, that's between you. And the third reality that Paul says, we're blessed to be a blessing. Do you understand how blessed you are? Do you understand all the blessings that you have? Is Because we can so often get in the trap of like, I don't have this and I don't have enough of this and I don't have enough of that and my house isn't that and I don't have, the, I don't have, I am so blessed by God. Everything that I have is a blessing and I want to bless other people. And that blessing abounds joy and thanksgiving and gratitude. There's no greater high in the world. People are sniffing and snorting and shooting stuff up all over the place all the time to just try to get some high and joy. And what they need to do is just start giving money away. Start serving people. There's no greater high and joy in the world than to help somebody else. Have you ever been blessed by somebody that who has come alongside you and gave to you when you were in need? Has that ever happened to anyone in this room? Don't tell me the whole story. Man, did it not bring joy to your heart? Is there something even more powerful though if you've been that person who got to contribute to the need of somebody else? Don't you walk away singing in zippity doo da day. Like there's nothing greater. There's no great higher, greater high in the world to them be able to serve and to give to somebody else. That's a blessing. And the more we do that, God says, I am I'm gonna make it rain on you. I am gonna open up the storehouses for you. And Malachi, he says, test me in this if you don't believe me, test me. I'm gonna bless you because you are blessing other people because you're being so guided by what's happening to you. The ultimate matter of all of this is a matter of heart and trust. Do I trust him and where is my heart? One more scripture and I'm gonna give you one little kind of visual to think about this as we close. Matthew chapter six, last scripture here. A picture of our hearts really is what all of this is. Matthew chapter 6, 19, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal and where people don't see red lights and run and crash their cars and you lose them. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where neither thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where's your heart at? Where is your heart at? And it's usually stored up with where my treasure is. Is it this? This is my stuff and my things. I've done over a hundred funerals now. Nobody's taking that stuff with them. Nobody. I've been in countless hospice rooms where people are dying and no one has ever said, Scott, bring me my car keys. I just want to hold them one last time. It's I want to see my family. It's Scott, could you read the scriptures with me? Why do we wait till when we're dying to things to get real about what's really real? Every day, live with what we treasure. Well, I knew how stirring this sermon was gonna be on giving and on tithing. So I asked Brad to bring the plates back in. We're gonna run it back again and just give. What do you see when you see this? Are you a wooden plate? Yes. First service, the first answer was, I see nothing from a kid. So yeah, nothing. See a wooden plate. They were in Rootstown. So let's be honest. This is what a lot of people see. Pull. <laughs> right, right, right. Like, here we go. What do you see? What do you see? You, do you see my notes or? Oh. A lot of people 
what we'll see too is this right here. This is what I think of when I think of church. The pastor standing with the plates. Give to the church. Give to the needy so I can drive a new Corvette, new whatever. Like, I, that church, they just want my money. What I see when I see this now is I see opportunity. I see opportunity. I see how we get to partner and be a part of the work that God is doing by putting a little bit in. A little bit that my wife and I have set aside that we've decide in our hearts and say, this is for God and this is for the work that God's doing. Is this the end all here to give here at this church? No. If you aren't being blessed here and you, and you don't believe in this, one, I'd ask you why you're here. Then give it somewhere else. Let me just give you a quick snippet. I'm taking the, the whole time. I, we, uh, we said we were getting out early, but we're not. Um, <laughs> think about this. This is our church right now. Here's a picture of one week in our church, just this last week. We left church. We got to go home, rest, whatever, for last Sunday. Monday. Last week. Monday. We are blessed that we have two full-time employees and a part-time employee. So this church is open through pretty much the whole everyday hours during the week. We have counseling. We have people that can come in, meetings, creates a space for me to be able to work on sermons and teachings and invite people in. Monday night, we had Celebrate Recovery as we do every Monday night in this church. Where this church is open, the lights are on, the heat is set, and everything's here so that people can come in and hopefully work to get free through what God's doing in their life and the leadership of Celebrate Recovery to be able to break free from the the hurts and habits and hangups and the things that are getting them and holding them back. This is open every Monday night. We get to be a part of that. Tuesday, we have a step group. I used to think a step group when I first heard it was exercise, like stepping, step aerobics. It's related to CR and working through steps. Tuesday night, we also have tumbling going on upstairs where students and kids can come here and work on tumbling. If you think we're in the gymnastics business just to create the next gymnast, we're not. It's about creating a place where people can connect and we can get to know people and come alongside people in need. Wednesday night, we have kids club from our little kids program and education and teaching and Bible studies and worship. We have two Bible studies for adults going on on Wednesday nights right now. Thursday at 10 o'clock in the back of the room here, I meet with for a Bible study for anyone that's available at 10 o'clock during the day. We have Bible study that we're open that people can come and go over more notes on the sermon and talk about the sermon. And that's what we do on Thursdays. Thursday nights right now, we don't have anything consistently meeting. Friday, we had a backpack program where people come in, fill up the bags, take them over to the Rootstown schools to be able to deliver those bags. It involves other churches. We're the host site for that to be able to bless students at Rootstown that have need that we can be a part of. Friday nights right now for about eight weeks, nine weeks, the women's Emmaus team that's coming up in the spring is having team meetings here. So 40 whatever women are gathering here every Friday night. The lights are on, the building is open, they're able to come in and we can host that. Saturday, we had the first father's, uh, father-son kind of Bible study from 7 to 8.30. We met here. When we left that Bible study, I walked out and people were gathered in the foyer setting up for the clothing distribution and folding clothes and unpacking clothes and getting all that that ready. At the same time, at nine o'clock yesterday, a group of teachers were coming in from our church to get training and encouragement and equip them to be teaching the students that we have teaching. About 10 o'clock yesterday, we had the clothing ministry and the distribution that happened yesterday at 10 o'clock here at this church where people could come and receive clothes from this church that we provide. Then the villas happened yesterday where the villas bingo event around what, two o'clock, three o'clock that was happening where people were taking stuff that we brought and gathered together over to the villas. We had volleyball going on last night with the church volleyball league that we have over at Sequoia. This morning, we've had two church services, which have Sunday school classes and Bible studies. We have food pantry right after church that you're all going to come participate in and do a little bit to help out. We serve a full meal. We give food, all the stuff that's been collected and be able to pack, package and put all that together. We go home, we rest a little bit. We have a marriage workshop tonight at six o'clock and youth group, senior high, junior, senior high, youth group going on at six o'clock tonight. That is one week in the life of our church. Not to mention the 20 some missionaries that we support that have been active in ministry all over the world this last week too. We get to do all that. So will you ask me what I see in this? Some of you get mad. Some of you think, oh, they just want my money. I see opportunity and I see blessing. And every dollar that comes in, we are able to bless and to be a part of people's lives. I am keenly aware of the fact that I am so blessed that I get called to do this and that you allow me to do this as a full-time job so that I can be a blessing to other people. And every funeral I do, every wedding I do, every outreach that I get to be a part of in this community, you all are with me. 
because this is our church, not my church. And everything we get to do is because of the blessing that we have together when we give. So when we give, it's to bless this church and it's to bless the ministry of God and it's to bless that we get to do together that we're a part of. I'm not today because we got food pantry, I'll be here serving. But today, well, what if next Sunday I decide to go to Cracker Barrel and I will be blessed. I'm gonna eat and I'm gonna eat to the full and I will be blessed. Wouldn't you think me wrong to then set my napkin down and fork and to say, yeah, that was good. And to walk out of that place and never pay a dime. This principle is at play at everything. I've been blessed, I bless you. We are in a very greedy culture and world full of cheap tippers, don't give to anybody. The idea is, have you been blessed? Then offer a blessing. If you aren't feeding well here, if you aren't eating well here, find somewhere that you are and bless that church and bless that place and partner with them in the work and ministry. Man, well, come on up. My prayer is that we would see the blessing and the work of the ministry that we have and the blessing and the opportunities that we get to have. If you are a part of our body and blessed by it, then be a part of the blessing. In today in particular, then give what you've decided in your heart, money. Give what you've decided in your heart and based on time and your talents, use what God has given to you. Maybe today it's like, I know I've never done this and I've never heard this, so I'm just, I'll start, I'll give $2, I'm gonna do that. Maybe it's the money thing. Maybe it's my time. Maybe it's giving of God. I'm, I have time, I can do this. Realize how much we've been blessed and the purpose of it is to be a blessing to other people. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your grace, your gifts, your blessing to us in so many variety of ways. Father, I pray that you would speak into our hearts and into our lives about the blessings that you have given to us and that you would use us to be a blessing. Thank you so much for all the ways, just a snapshot of the last week of this church and all that you have given us, the opportunities, the, the, the service, the ways in which we can partner with you to touch the lives of people in this community and around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Father, I thank you for the men and women, the families that make up this church. I thank you for this family, my family. I thank you for their work. I thank you for their service. I thank you for their giving. I thank you for their partnership. I thank you for what you're allowing us together to do. I'm so grateful for them for our work, for our family, and the blessing that you've given to me to be their pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for all your gifts. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, we pray, amen.